My name is Alex Dorge and I'm an Ansible specialist. And today I'm going to be walking through the Ansible Automation Platform 2.5 and the changes that have happened to authentication. So what's actually changed from an authentication perspective? If you're used to Ansible Tower all the way through Automation Platform 2.4, you may be used to each individual component having its own separate UI and separate login, as well as its own separate setup for that login. Controller always used to be done through the UI or through config as code. Automation Hub would be done through the installer itself, and then Event Driven Ansible only had local auth available. This also meant that I had separate organizations, teams, and role-based access control for each individual component. Now that's located in a central place in that platform UI, but I still leveraged that role-based access control at the organization team or user level. So that aspect of authorization has not changed between 2.4 and 2.5. From a setup perspective, all of this is done via the UI or via config as code. And then each authentication detail, which is the setup of how I authenticate into that method, whether it's IDM, Active Directory, or a SAML provider, that's unique per type because obviously each authentication method has different requirements for it, whether it's these parameters get mapped to usernames, this is my bind user for a LDAP provider, all of that is unique. And then when I go into the authentication mapping, it's consistent regardless of what type I picked. So whether I'm picking SAML, whether I'm picking LDAP, whether I'm picking OIDC, authentication mapping is consistent for every single auth method. It's also shifted to a rule-based method. So in the past, it used to be this pretty massive JSON list that wasn't necessarily the most intuitive. Now it's all rule-based. So I can say this group maps to this team, this user you know, LDAP attribute maps to this exact organization admin. So all of that's handled, so I don't have to worry about organization aliases or team aliases from a SAML perspective, and it's just much more intuitive. There are also some changes if you are using SAML to make sure all of your attributes are correctly pulled into the automation platform and mapped, and to get transparent login actually set up and working. So let's jump into a demonstration to show how these things have changed. So jumping into the demonstration, as you can see, I've already logged into the automation platform, but if you've never been here before, everything's broken down now into various sections based on the what used to be individual components. So I've got that section for automation controller, I have a section for event driven Ansible, and I have a section for automation hub. So if you notice, there is nothing related to organizations, teams, access controls within any of these sections. It's all maintained now in the access management section, which is maintained at the platform UI level. So just like you're used to before, I have the organization's teams, users all set up here. And then I have my authentication methods, which I'll go through in a second. But everything from the user perspective is exactly as you're used to before. So I can still at a very various user level, assign roles, which use admin, view, all the different roles that you're used to for the individual components are all maintained here. So whether it's for automation execution, decisions, or content, or I can do the same thing at the team level where I can assign those permissions to the various teams, just like I would do in the past. So personally, I generally set up my teams and organizations first and then set up the authentication methods to map to those various teams and orgs. But again, all of that's maintained just like it was before. As you can see, I've added execute access to various job templates here. I can then add various roles for automation decisions, which is event driven Ansible. So all of that's available here, just like it was in the individual components in the past. So once you get those set up, it's generally jumping into authentication methods. So by default, there are always several that are here. So if you're doing an upgrade, you'll see the legacy options that are here and you also see that local database authenticator. So that's for local users that you've created. You can see I've already created two different mappings, but don't worry about that. I'm gonna create a new authentication. So all the authentication types are available here, everything from Azure AD to GitHub to Google OAuth to LDAP, which is what I'm gonna start with, and then SAM will be the second one that I will walk through. So jumping into LDAP first, when I click next, this will be specific to that type that I selected. So this is unique just to LDAP. I will call this you know, IDM2 because I already have one. Then it's just like you'd expect before. So it's setting up the LDAP server URI, setting up that bind DN, which should be something that you're used to for setting up any other LDAP mapping. Then it's setting up the actual password, which in theory you've got stored somewhere for whatever that particular user is. Again, setting up your group type. Since I have nested groups, I need to use a nested group of names type. And then I also have a DN template. 
So all the rest, a lot of the rest of these are optional parameters. So I'm going to put in some defaults based on what I've used in the past. There is a new one that was not required before this LDAP group type parameters was not a required field in any of the older automation platform versions. So you may have to update that if you're trying to copy over from existing uh, automation platform usage. Group search and attribute mapping is essentially setting up how users and groups get mapped in and found. So making sure that the appropriate attributes get mapped in, and then I'll also set up my user search. Then I've got options here to either enable, create objects, or remove users. This is very similar to what you saw before, but in this case, I'm just going to click enabled. But you can see that what it means for each individual option. You know, should it be active? I can obviously activate it later. Should this be able to create users, organizations, and teams? And can this remove users from sources? So if a user you know, no longer exists, it would, or they've changed roles and so they're no longer a system administrator, they're just a normal user, it would handle those processes. So you can check as many or as few as you want. Then this jumps to that mapping screen that I talked about. This is consistent across every authentication type. So I can just click add authentication mapping, and these are the five options that exist. So allow allows access into the platform itself. Organization obviously maps into an individual organization that you've created. Team assigns to a team. Then it can add in a role. So if my role is something as simple as you know an org member or something like that. I will say generally I don't really use uh, personally the um, role option. And then there's the super user option, which is essentially setting up for, to be a you know admin or the system administrator for the platform. So obviously role is more likely to use if you have a platform auditor that you want to get set up. But for now, I will do allow and then I'll do organization as well. So I'll do allow access to AAP. And then you've got multiple triggers. So there are four triggers, again, regardless of what authentication type that you use. Always and never are fairly straightforward. Groups are what I use for LDAP and then attributes are what I use for SAML, which I'll walk through in a second. So when I click groups, You'll see, A, I can click revoke, which means remove access if someone isn't part of this particular thing. Operation is or or and. If I have multiple groups that someone has to be a part of to be able to be mapped to this particular group in the platform, I would pick and. If I'm only putting in one LDAP group, I can just use or or and. It does not matter. So I can click select groups. If you notice, nothing's here. So in this case, I would start typing in you know, CN equals so on and so forth. Or in my case, I'm just going to copy and paste. And this is going to, and then I just click create. And this will now allow access into the platform. Fairly simple for allow, but let's jump into something like mapping to an organization. As you saw, I already have several orgs that exist. So let's say, you know, network or mapping. And this again, I'll have triggered on groups. I'll keep it as an or in this case. And once, because I've already created that one group, it will populate here. If there's a separate group that you've got that you still need to populate in, you can just type that in in this situation. So that's kind of the nice thing is the drop down makes it a little bit easier as you've pre-populated groups. So especially if I've got one thing to map into an org and then I want to map it into a team later on, that will pre-populate. And also when I click organization, it shows all the orgs that I've already created. Yes, you can type in a new one. So I've got if I've got a random org of, uh, let's just say Azure, I can type it and then, you know, add it in there. This will basically create that organization for me. But in my case, I do want to add them to my networking org. This is a networking group. And then I can pick org admin or org member. So this is the same thing works for teams as well. So if I go back and just go to teams, network team, I'll go once again to groups. Again, because I didn't save it before, I can click create, pick the team that exists or type in a new one. So I want this to be my network ops team. Pick the org that, that this team is, that this user needs to be part of. And again, select the role of, are they a team admin or team member? So all of this is now handled here. I can create as many different ones as I want. And then when I click next, oops, helps if I actually put in the correct operation. So it is smart to do that. When I click next, I can then order the mapping. So if I decide actually, you know, I want, the orgs be mapped, then all the teams, then all the super users, however you want that set up that can all be handled here, then I can review and go through that process. So all of this is now available and would, in my case, be enabled to do this process. I'm going to click cancel because I've already got this set up. So this allows the login then via normal LDAP login. So the LDAP login works the same, um, whether it's through the, the UI here or it's through the API. It's supposed to leverage my LDAP user. 
um, and I'm basically just going to enter this in. So if you also notice, these are ordered, so I can change the order of these. If you notice, I've got IDM first, then my SAML login of Okta, then I use my local user. You can adjust these so that I can manage authentications and adjust the order based on how you want the platform to handle that. So the next thing I'm gonna do is create that SAML login because there are quite a number of things that have changed here. Um, if you notice, this now looks completely different than what you saw for the LDAP setup. So I'm going to call this, you know, Okta SAML. This will then be a lar large portion of kind of what you're used to from a SAML perspective. So obviously my entity ID will be my platform, the SAML public cert. So this is kind of one of the things that you should create. Easiest way to do that is in, you know, anything that has open SSL, I can run this command to generate a key and certificate that I can use. You can adjust the days, all of that, you can adjust the names. And then essentially what this has done is this has created these two available for me. So I've got a cert.pem and I can just copy and paste this into that field. So this is my certificate. And then obviously the private key is that private key that I'll paste in a second but it will verify that those are the, the cert and key match. So it is something to consider. It will do that for you. And because I'm going to immediately delete these after I use them, I'm not worried about you know, showing this in a public setting. So this is that private key. And then this goes into the private key section. So the rest is from the IDP side. So this you'll get from whatever your provider is, whether it's Okta, whether it's Entra ID, whatever. So I already know what mine are, obviously. So I'm going to paste that in for my Okta instance. You'll get your public cert from, again, your uh, provider, whether that's Azure AD SAML. You will need to make sure that you put in begin certificate in front. This is your X509 certificate. So if it does not include this, you'll need to put in begin certificate and end certificate at the end. Otherwise, it won't work for you. It'll just give you an error and say it's not a valid cert. Entity ID, again, you'll get from your provider. And then this is just the mapping that you're used to from whatever your SAML provider is. So if I go into, in my case, my Okta instance, you'll see that I've got various attributes that are getting mapped in, first name, last name, email, username, so on and so forth. That's basically what I'm gonna to provide to map that into the automation platform. So this, when a user logs in, this will map in their email, username, last name, and first name. So I am going to leave this blank. So A, it's not a required field, and B, this will get auto-populated after I save. So this will give me a random um, login based on the name of what I call this. And this will end up being that ACS URL that goes into your SAML provider. A few other things. So there are some additional authenticator fields. So by default, when I log in, if I make no other changes to this, the only parameters that would be available to map in in the mapping session would be email, username, last name, and first name. That's it. If you notice, I have additional fields here. I have organization, department, user type. None of those would be available for mapping unless I do one of two things. I can either in this additional authenticator fields populate in this YAML, which is get all extra data true which means every attribute that gets sent from my SAML provider, I want to leverage, or there's a section at the bottom for SAML IDP to extra data attribute mapping. I can put in a list of attributes that I want to also include. So you've got both options depending on what you're most comfortable with. This will obviously limit to only take in the original fields that I've populated as well as department, user type, and organization, or I can use that get all extra data to be true. Again, this is just based on what you're comfortable with from your aspect. Organization info, you can be exactly the same as you're used to with the, within the automation platform, so I'm just gonna paste those in. Technical contact and support provider contact, again, is exactly what you're used to. And then I'm gonna add in some extra config data. So again, this is exactly the same from here on out from the actual mapping, but I will walk through that because this is now leveraging attributes versus leveraging the groups that I used before. So again, I'll start with, in this case, organization. So let's call this again, network org trigger. In this case, instead of selecting groups, I'm going to select attributes because I'm leveraging SAML attributes to make this mapping happen. So in this case, 
again, or or and, depending on how you want to leverage this, I'm going to pick or, and then I'm going to know that my organization maps to conveniently organization. And then you've got a comparison. So depending on if you're leveraging regex, whether you want it to be equal, matches, contains, that's all up to you. I know mine's going to match, and I'm going to put in my value, which in this case should be networking. So when the organization is networking, I want it to map to my networking org as a networking member. Perfect. Same thing then applies for every other type. So if you notice this, again, it's exactly the same. The only difference is I'm now using the attributes trigger, and this is the exact attribute that I want to take from my SAML provider. And, and conveniently enough, my org name is called network, and that's going to match one for one. So this then walks through that entire process. I got that same capability to adjust the mapping afterwards. And you'll notice one other thing. So this obviously walks through getting all of the different parameters. Once this is set up, I'll now have this Okta button, which will leverage the name of what I call that authentication method. But I talked about before, you know, hey, I want transparent SAML setup. So that is something that is different from 2.4 and older. It used to be whatever parameter you put in, there was a key where I could call it, you know, Okta, my IDP, that's changed. So it's still the default relay state is the period and function that I want to do, but it's going to be the same, but I'll show how I figured this out. So in the API, I went to the API gateway V1 UI auth for my existing Okta um, SAML login that I've created. There is this login URL. And if you notice, it adds this question mark IDP equals capital I, lowercase d, capital P. This IDP is my default relay state that I want to put into my SAML provider for transparent login to work. So in my case in Okta, all I did was in that default relay state, I put in default relay state of IDP. So now from, in my case, my Okta provider, you'll notice I'm completely logged out. I'm not going to click this button. I'm going to go into my apps dashboard and I'll just click here. And this will successfully bring me into the platform. So this took me quite a bit to figure out. That is a key aspect. If you want transparent logins to work from your SAML provider, you need to make sure that your default relay state or relay state, whatever the, the field name is, is set to IDP. That will ensure that transparent logins work. So really that's the two biggest things that I learned from the SAML side of things is default relay state needs to be IDP and then the specific fields to make sure that everything gets mapped incorrectly. So making sure the additional authenticator field was either that get all extra data to be true or the SAML IDP to extra data attribute mapping was the additional attributes that I want to get mapped into the platform. Otherwise, nothing gets passed to the platform, which meant nothing was available to actually do that mapping in the back end. So I was able to get users into the platform, but none of the mapping was working. So please make sure you check your particular SAML setup to verify that you do have either this field or this field set for this to work properly. So hopefully that gives you a good walkthrough of some of the changes related to the automation platforms, authentication and authorization. So obviously take the time to go through the official documentation. It talks through all the other various setup methods. I know I only walk through LDAP and SAML for this example, but I know those are generally the two most common methods and the mapping aspect will be the same regardless of what method you pick. So that will give you some consistency as you go through that process. I highly encourage you to make sure, especially for using SAML, check out those two specific fields because personally, I had some issues with it because they were not fields that I was used to in the past ever having to populate. So it did throw me off when I was trying to set up my SAML mapping from Okta. Thanks for taking the time today to learn a little bit more about SAML and general authentication into the automation platform 2.5 and how that's changed versus the other automation platforms. Click my picture on the right to subscribe or click the image on the left to watch another video.